the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, good afternoon, members. We'll make a start to uh, this meeting. You're all welcome back after, I'm sure, what didn't feel like a break at all. Certainly it wasn't for me. Um, we do have a quorum, so can I call the meeting to order? And uh, I want to declare the meeting open to the public online. And can I welcome members who are particip participating by the video conferencing, uh, Paula Bradshaw. And, uh, I want to remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. <coughs> so we're moving straight to apologies, which is our first item, and we have an apology from the chair, Colin Gildenew. You're very welcome, Alan. Um, so with that, then we have otherwise a, a fairly full attendance here today. So we're going to move on straight to um, our uh, presentation from the minister and uh, his officials who are here now, and then we will come back to the business. So we're moving on to um, agenda item five in order to facilitate the minister. <clears throat> okay. I refer members to uh, tab five of the meeting pack, which includes a number of items of correspondence from the minister uh, on table five of the table papers, which is a report on the rapid learning initiative received yesterday. Um, can I advise you, members, that the Minister, the Chief Scientific Advisor and the Chief Medical Officer are here to, to, today to update the Committee on COVID-19 and other matters. So may I welcome Mr Robin Swan, Minister of Health, Professor Ian Young, the Chief Scientific Advisor and Dr Michael McBride, the Chief Medical Officer. You're very welcome here today. And I just wanted to say from the outset that uh, uh, to acknowledge the, the incredible volumes of work that have been ongoing, not just by yourselves, but by the entire healthcare system. And we do appreciate that. And it's still very difficult times, as we know, and I'm sure you'll want to update us further. I also wanted to acknowledge the uh, recent announcement of the increased payments to those affected by the infected blood issue. That's uh, very important and welcome that the payments will be in line with those uh, in England. That's very welcome news. And uh, also wanted to just mention that we welcome the return of the services to the Regional Fertility Centre. So um, I want to just invite the Minister to brief at this stage. And I know you're tight for time, Minister, um, and you have to get back to an executive meeting. So we'll let you go with your brief now, and then I'll ask you some questions. And, and Chair, thanks. Uh, and thanks for your, your comments, and, and I think acknowledging um, the work of the entire health and social care system um, since we last met at the end of July. I think that work continues and continues at the, the same in, intensity. So I think it's useful that we came here today just to provide you an, an, an update of what what has been happening and answer any questions. Uh, and as this this is the first briefing since the summer recess, I intend to keep my opening remar remarks brief to allow the committee more time um, for questions. And as you indicated, Chair. Uh, the executive meeting that was meant to have happened and completed prior to this committee session is, is resuming again at half three, so I, I will unfortunately I need back to, to, to attend to some pieces of business in that. Uh, Chair, it's been a long six months, and you know, I can understand how COVID fatigue has started to set in uh, amongst some people. Um, some may even think the worst of the virus has passed and that they no longer need to watch, watch their distance or wash their hands, but as I said, and I've said numerous times, they're wrong, because this is still the biggest public health crisis in, in our generation. We are facing into what will, in all likelihood, be an incredibly difficult winter, and prevalence of the virus still is increasing. But I feel it is important yet again to express my gratitude uh, to all our health and social care staff who are working under conditions that, in, in, that from January, none of us could ever have imagined. Um, our retail sector has reopened. The tourism and hospitality sector has been largely reopened, sub subject to some continuing restrictions and social distancing measures. Uh, one notable exception, however, is that wet pubs, uh, those that don't serve food or whilst have no outdoor areas, are still not permitted to, to reopen. And I think, as members are aware, that's currently been discussed uh, by the executive. 
I am also very pleased to see that our children are once again returning to school. Uh, no one expected it to be easy, but on the whole, I do believe the return of schools has gone well. The gradual reopening of society, and now most recently our schools, has unsus unsurprisingly placed increased pressures on our testing system. Um, today, and um, our, our, our dashboard will have been published at two o'clock. Today, we will have reported 8,013 individual tests across Pillar One and Pillar Two. Uh, a month ago, we were testing around a quarter of that each day, and we are testing many more people per head of population than our neighbours. Chair, that is the, the highest number of tests we have completed in any single day. Uh, the demand for testing is increasing uh, right across the UK and right across all channels. In all likelihood, that increase in demand will continue, and testing will continue to play a hugely important role in the weeks and months ahead. And that is why I am also ramping up the testing options within Pillar 1. Um, so, Chair, let me be clear. I am assured that we do have enough testing capacity. Anyone who needs a test will get a test. For the few people that are experiencing difficulties in booking a test, I would ask them to leave that automatic system for an hour and try again, because more tests are put online as demand increases. I would be very concerned, however, if an inaccurate public narrative were to develop that tests aren't available or that people have to travel excessive distances. Um, such a misunderstanding could see people that need tested not coming forward. So, For those who are claiming we haven't enough tests available, I would repeat the point that yesterday uh, we tested many more people than ever we have before, and that testing is there for everyone that needs it. I would also like to take this opportunity to repeat the message that testing is available for all members of the public who have symptoms of COVID. Um, these are, as, as members well know, but worth repeating, new continuous cough, a fever, high temperature, loss or a change of sense or taste or smell. So, If anyone has these symptoms, they should self-isolate and book the test. If you do not have these specific symptoms, but do you have other COVID-like symptoms or, or cold-like symptoms or runny nose, you don't need to get tested. You do not need to self-isolate, and a child can go to school if they are fit to do so. Um, Chair, the Stop COVID NI Proximity app is working well. Uh, to date, there have been over 325,000 downloads of the app, and of yesterday, there have been 475 exposure notifications issued. So those are 475 people who were identified via the app that they have been in contact uh, with someone who was COVID positive. They may have been picked up through contact tracing and her trace, test tracing protect system, but there may be some of those who would not. So the app is, is working for us. Uh, work is also continuing within my department on rebuilding the HSC services, increasing service capacity as quickly as possible <coughs> across all programmes of care uh, with prevailing COVID-19 conditions. At the same time, we need to plan for potential future surges of the virus to ensure we remain prepared, particularly as this may coincide with general winter pressures we face. Um, yesterday, committee members may be aware that I announced the establishment of our second Nightingale facility, um, this time at White Abbey Hospital. My officials are currently developing an, uh, the regional surge framework, which will provide a high-level overview of learning from the first wave and the regional approaches taken across key areas, uh, such as elective care, orthopaedic services and care homes, to ensure that HSC is prepared for future surges. Um, as with the trust rebuilding plans, the individual trusts will carry out their own local engagement with stakeholders and TUAS on their individual surge plans. But I am keen to get opinion now on the regional surge framework, and that is why last night I shared the draft with the key stakeholders which included trade unions and the Transformation Advisory Board members, before publication at the end of this month. In concluding, Chair, and uh, concluding my opening remarks, I would like to reiterate my previous briefing to the Committee. Um, given the complexity and scale of the challenges we face, it is vital that our health and social care system is given clear direction and that decisions are taken quickly in a fluid and changing environment. We will not be able to return to business as usual. The rebuilding of services will not happen overnight, but they will require a response that is rapid yet flexible to ensure the system can respond to further potential COVID-19 surges. And, Chair, that is my, my opening comments. As I wanted to keep them brief so we can engage with, with members. Thank you, Minister, and we very, do, very much appreciate you keeping your 
and that's to a minimum at this point so that we can get plenty of questions in. It's great to hear the app is working so well and in conjunction with the um, Test Trace Protect. That's um, very welcome news and um, also welcome the news, although I think everybody was maybe a little taken aback by the second Nettingale facility. Uh, that that has been planned, but it's it's good and it's good to be cautious and, and have those plans in place. On, on that um, facility, um, you had removed the car parking charges for um, for staff members working uh, in those incredibly hard conditions, and they're now back to paying charges again. And certainly, um, I declare an interest as having a family member who is a nurse who travels actually a considerable distance. Um, to her workplace and then has to pay ridiculous fees or, or not take buses and, and walk um, dark, lonely paths late at night after shifts to get back to your car to then to have the long journey home. Are you looking at, um, again, withdrawing those uh, car parking charges for those staff members? And um, I would encourage you, if, if at all possible, to actually abolish them altogether, if that's possible. That would be my first point on the Nettingale facility. Um, the two facilities that, that, that will be there um, and also appreciate where you're coming from with the COVID fatigue. Certainly we all see it, uh, especially on social media, it's actually quite frightening to see the, the extreme uh, between those who are terrified to leave their home and those who think this is just the flu. Um, we're all talking nonsense. So uh, that is a big concern. Um, testing, that's an incredible amount of testing going on and we absolutely welcome that. We've come a long way from, I think it was 40? 40, 45, 45 per day. So we've come an awful long way now. We're well over 8,000 uh, a day. So that's also to be welcome and we understand the, the pressures that the schools are turning and hopefully that will settle and, and uh, fears will settle in, in, in the uh, incoming weeks and months ahead. In terms of rebuilding services in particular, this is probably the most worrying element for me, and I do welcome the, the announcements of the initiatives at, at Lagan Valley and Old Geldon and Musgrave in terms of electric care and orthopaedic surgery. Um, but can I ask you specifically <coughs> on that um, to provide an update on that, and with particular emphasis on cancer services, um, the day procedures and orthopaedics and outpatient appointments, and have you a timetable for full resumption and what proportion of the services do you believe the Trust will be able to sustain should a second wave of COVID-19 present itself in the winter months? We'll kick off with that one. Okay. Just for a starter, Chair. For a starter. Um, I, I think, Chair, going back to uh, the Nightingale facility, what we're envisaging at White Abbey is it's actually a step-down facility from, um, from the uh, acute and social settings. So it's not the same as, as what we had um, at the Ulster, at the tar block within the Ulster hospital, hospital, in regards to concentrated ICU beds, that facility will still be there, um, should we need it. But I think what we saw in the first first surge in the management, in regards to the number of ICU beds we needed, it was more that set step down facility that was more crucial to to supporting patients in the recovery. So the, the development of the White Abbey will be a specific site uh, for that step down service. And then where we see where that can can actually progress as well. Um, so that was announced yesterday as part of, of the engagement we're now having with TUS and our TAB members as well to make sure the understanding is there. Uh, in regards to to the car parking charges, I know I'm aware of of what uh, asks have been there, and it's it's important to point out that different trusts have different approaches um, to car parking charges in regards to not just visitors but also to staff as well. So when the first surge was a, an intervention we made, if there was a second surge, I'm sure it was an intervention we would make um, the second time, but there's eight million pounds there that trusts um, have to find. Um, we're engaging in Nobel Fast Trust was actually doing a consultation at this moment in time. Uh, so centrally, we've reintroduced car parking charges, but it's something that we keep under continual review in regards to how we support our staff, but it is something that's in trust hands um, as to how they actually implement that that policy. Um, the, the point you made uh, in regards to fatigue, uh, and as we say, you know, from the Chief Medical Officer, Chief Scientific Advisor to anyone across the health service, and I think from yourselves as members of the committee, that fatigue, that that noise that's now in the background is, is concerning to us because it does it, it does start to instill that um, that that impression, I think, Chair, that, that you indicated, you know, this is just a 
this is just a flu. And I think, as we said to many at the start, you know, for the majority, this will be a flu-like virus. But for you know, over over 600 people who have passed away because of it, it's more than a flu-like virus. You know, for those families, and for anyone who has contacted the virus and come through it, it's still it's still a concern in regards to long COVID. Is now as, as uh, I think the expression that's been used to describe those who've had COVID but still suffer from some of the some of the symptoms of it, and have, haven't spoke to some of them as well. You know, when you talk to someone who has spent time in ICU and you can hear them still having difficulty actually catch a breath because of the after effects of COVID. You know, this is more than, than a flu and this is why we're taking the steps and, and the direction um, that we are doing at this moment in time. In regards to, to testing, um, we were, um, and I suppose we've seen it across the rest of, of the United Kingdom, as schools come back, there was an increased demand on testing. Um, if we follow the same trends, that starts to die off because there is an understandable nervousness, uh, not just within staff, but within parents and grandparents as well. So we've seen an increase um, a number of people approaching our testing systems, also approaching our COVID centres as well. So, but that's that's where we're, we're working our way through it. And I'll just ask anybody, you know, please stick with with the system. Additional tests do come on. It's done in a two book system. You book in the morning for the afternoon and evening test. You book in the evening for the next morning test. So more tests do become available. We have seen um, some anomalies because the the UK because the, the Pillar Two system is a national testing system. It's done online. So it directs someone to the closest available test. Now, unfortunately, what we do see at some points, if, especially if you're living down the, the east coast or the east of the province, geographically, the computer says it may be Scotland. And I think we had the reverse uh, two and a half, three weeks ago, where you know, some of the, the test centres in Scotland were actually being directed here. I think it's something that, that Jerry actually raised. So it, it looks that's, that's how the system appears. But if you come back onto the system, you will be directed to a local uh, or a more local uh, testing facility. We are working with our, our partners in, in Pillar 1, which is you know, concentric in, in, in the West, AFBE, uh, ALMAC as well, to increase that Pillar 1 testing capacity. But you know, having, having performed 8,000, just over 8,000 tests yesterday, it's a, it's a large step from where we are, and we keep pushing that envelope to make sure, sure it is there. Um, we have, and, and again, we've had the, the interaction with the uh, Department of Education and the Education Authority to make sure that people understand if you have symptoms, get a test. If it's not symptoms, if it's a concern, you know, approach your GP and get guidance, guidance from that way as well. So that, that piece of work's ongoing. Um, Michael and Ian meet twice weekly now with the Education Authority and the Department of Education while we get through while we get through the reopening of schools. We're also aware, Chair, that that testing uh, pressures will also come again when we look to the reopening of universities as well, because those numbers of people come back to, I suppose, centralised locations will put pressures, but it's something that we, we were building into to, to our system. Um, your, your last point, Chair, I think, was on, on the rebuilding plans of the services, and it's the steps that we've taken, the announcements we made, especially, you know, come back to July in regards to orthopaedics and elective care as to how we put in a facility that can ensure that we continue to provide those services uh, to the people who need it so that if we do, and I, I hope we don't have the same sort of surge that we did at the first point, that we have to close down services. So it's making sure that we have facilities and staff available uh, that can continue through those. Uh, in regards to rebuilding cancer, it's one of the priorities that we're working across all trusts because it is, you know, as a time-limited service, as a time-limited interaction that we do have to to build in, and that's working with the trust to, to do that. The trust plans um, are due there every three months, so the current one runs out at the end of September, so trusts are already working on the October, November, December delivery plans as to where they see, see the increases. Those are, those are available online and published online. Uh, there's also targets now as to how many people, how many uh, different patients they intend to see under each one of those service locations. So it's about setting them targets as well that, that we're trying to push up. So. Where we will, we have seen an increase in our waiting lists. Um, that was expected; it's to be expected. But until we can get back on top of, of of where we were, it was a as a fragile system that we had. It was fragile in January. Uh, it was fragile through the first wave, but it's re trying to rebuild in that capacity so we can start to to claw back some of those those operations and procedures that we need to be getting on with. I think that's most of your points, Chair. If there's anything there, you need further clarification on.
Okay, thank you. Um, and in terms of uh, the sick, the care homes, will the sick pay that has been paid out will that be continue to be funded? And is that is this now a permanent scenario? It's not permanent, Chair, but it has been extended while while funds are there because we do realise the value that it supplies, the reassurance it gives to those workers who do need to to, to self isolate. Uh, the Rabbit Learn initiative initiative which was published yesterday um, drafted by the chief nursing officer points to a number of interventions that we need to take and supports um, that we we learned from uh, in regards to to the first wave and that is how we further support um, our independent care home sector and the people who especially the people um, who are working in it so that initiative is there and chair we are seeing um, we are seeing and it'll be reported today you know we, we have 21 care homes again where we have confirmed um, outbreaks. Um, that is being highlighted because of you know, the testing of staff and the retesting of residents as well. So anywhere where we see two positive cases, uh, we will declare that a confirmed outbreak so we can make sure the interventions are there um, quickly, make sure that the virus doesn't spread within the house or in the home. Sorry. Um, and I think what we are seeing, and Ian can maybe give a, a bit of an indication on this, or Michael, what we are seeing is that those are uh, asymptomatic. Yep. Uh, tests that we're now indicating in care homes. So it's about that early indication, asymptomatic either residents um, or staff, that if we can get them indicated, get them isolated and get them supported as well, it prevents a further further spread within that home. I don't know, Ian or Michael, if you want to. Yeah, I mean, I think just on the on the care home side of things, I think uh, it is a different picture than we saw in the in the first wave. Um, Chair. Um, in terms of that, the you know we have, uh, as you know, completed our first round of testing of all care home staff and residents as of the end of June, as uh, minister's direction, and the next wave of that, based on the evidence from the scientific advisor group on, on, on emergencies and also international evidence, commenced on the third of August. Now, from that, we've tested some over, over twenty-four thousand. Uh, staff and residents. We have an excellent cooperation, I have to say, from the independent care home sector. There have been some uh, challenges, obviously, in terms of resources, uh, and we're working with the sector in terms of providing additional support. Uh, there's been additional training around infection prevention control that's gone on, on over the summer, a range of seminars. Trusts continue to support those care homes where there are active outbreaks. Um, and there's a new uh, portal uh, which has been launched by DHSC for those care homes that don't uh, have um, outbreaks so that they can register on bulk uh, the residents for and staff for ongoing regular testing. Obviously, we use Pillar 1 uh, as opposed to Pillar 2 for those care homes where there are active outbreaks. But as the Minister said, what we're seeing now is the active case finding as a result of the testing uh, programme, and that means that we can respond immediately to close down outbreaks. Um, so when we see two or more uh, we test everybody, um, and residents and staff. We then test uh, a day four to seven to make sure that we're getting on top of the outbreak. That's everybody again. Uh, and then once uh, the outbreak is confirmed as closed at day 14, we go back again at day 28 and again retest everyone just to be absolutely certain that we've closed down uh, the outbreak efficiently and effectively. So, as I say, we know that the population in care homes remain vulnerable. We know that um, you know, staff uh, working in the environment are very pressurised. Uh, they're providing close, very personal care. Obviously, the high standards of infection prevention control and PPE hopefully will minimise that um, that risk in as far as possible. But indeed, you know, it is likely as community transmission increases, we may potentially uh, see uh, further uh, outbreaks. I think in all of this, we will keep the situation under review in terms of the frequency of testing of staff and residents. Um, I hope. Uh, we can avoid getting into a situation uh, where we imposed a sort of blanket ban on visiting because that is hugely detrimental uh, to residents and indeed to relatives, and, you know, many of whom are in the uh, last months of, of, of life. And uh, you know, I think that's something we should try and avoid at all costs while managing and mitigating uh, the risks of infection. That's a very uh, well, I'm glad you raised the visitation because I was going to raise it um, because obviously the emotional. Uh, mental well-being of um, those who are in these care homes is is vitally important, and, and often they're they're um, individuals who are who are not in those settings for a, a terribly long time. And what time you do have it needs to be quality. You need to be able to see members of your family. I have plenty more questions here, but listen, I'm, I'm going to. 
open it up to everybody else to make sure everybody gets a, a chance to come in. So Colin had indicated first, and then Jerry, and then, then Alex. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, coming along today, and, and commend you on the work that you're doing. Um, um, Minister, in the leadership, you're certainly the most popular Ulster um, Unionist MLA in South Down, <laughs> anyway, from the people that I'm talking to. So uh, to pass on um, what is uh, some good regard for you in that. Um, I suppose the issue of testing, you've kind of touched there about the work that goes on between the education service, and obviously we are in the first week uh, of schools being back, but there's lots of evidence coming through that schools are saying that if a child has any symptom of any sickness at all, that they are to stay at home and that they're not allowed to return until there's a test that's done that proves that it's negative, and some are even suggesting that the whole family need to be tested. And I heard the figure this morning of the number of tests that have been completed versus the number that would actually be required. And I'm just wondering, is there some way of really ramping up that clear message of when a test is required and when it isn't? And maybe even speaking again to the Education Authority to send out a very clear, very concise message to schools as to when they should and should not ask for testing. And just as a sub thing on testing, sometimes if people aren't able to avail um, of the online system that books them in. As you've correctly said, I have had two cases where they've been told one to go to the Isle of Man and one to go to Scotland, and they've come to me to ask, can they get on the boat if they've got uh, coronavirus? And that's caused difficulties. Um, but is there a way, the home kit, I know, maybe could you talk us through how that is sent out? And if possible, would it be a suggestion if there are a supply of them maybe in pharmacies that somebody, if they did need it, somebody could go down and get them a test kit and have it to them within an hour, because most people can get somebody to pop the chemist for them, um, and if there was a supply of the home kits, it would get them very quickly into the post that day and get processed. Okay, um, I think, you know, Colin, Colin come back to, to the message on, on schools, there's a conversation was actually had, um, I'm not, I don't think I'm breaking any confidence that the executive are there today between ourselves and Education Minister, a number of Ministers raised the exact point you're in, and I think it's you know we, we talked yesterday. But you know if you have symptoms, but again, as a concerned parent, my nine-year-old and seven-year-old went back to school on Tuesday, so I, I know what the the apprehension is among among many, many parents, and the ease is you know go and get a test, you know just to m make sure. What I think we're saying is you know if you have symptoms, get tested. If your if your child's ill, keep them at home anyway, as, as good as good practice. But we are working with education. Uh, the Education Authority, Department of Education. There's a meeting again tomorrow, in regards to communication to make sure that there's no deviation or no uh, ability to, I, I suppose, see confusion between what we're saying, saying as a public health message and what the Department of Education or the Education Authority have put out around schools. We're seeing very responsible messaging coming from from the majority of schools. But again, the concern of parents or was all, will always be the concern of parents. So it's about simplifying that message and having the conversation so that there's that continuity. And do you want to maybe uh, pick up on, on the message? And in regards to, to the, the, the postal kits, um, we haven't had the discussion with Pillar 1, which is the national one, about making them available um, in pharmacies. There is a programme that we're talking to is about making 10 tests available in schools. Uh, which can then be taken home by a child to be used at home, not for the school to use, but you know, so that there's a, a quicker turnaround there to, to give that reassurance for those. So I don't know if either Ian or Michael wants to pick up on, on those specific. I mean, just on the messaging, um, I think absolutely. I think we accept that there's a lack of public understanding about when a test is appropriate. And um, we're meeting with the education um, authority um, tomorrow to discuss just a really clear piece of messaging and um, that can go out so that everybody is completely clear. It's the symptoms which Minister referenced earlier and um, the new continuous cough, loss of sense of taste or smell or an elevated temperature. And it's those symptoms which require a test. Other symptoms at the moment do not require a test. Um, now, that's something that's kept continually under review as the scientific evidence changes. But if there is any change in the symptoms that would require a test, there will be very clear messaging um, around that. Um, and we'll also look to address the issue. We've been asked questions ourselves. You know, if a child gets tested, no, the rest of the household do not need to get tested unless they have symptoms themselves. 
if, if a child is a contact and is advised to self-isolate by the PHA, um, the rest of the household do not need to self-isolate unless the child develops symptoms themselves, in which case the child needs to get a test and everybody isolates until the results of the test are available. But we're going to try to answer all of those questions and agree some really clear messaging and put that out very quickly. And I hope this will all settle down and everybody will get used to it in the next week to 10 days. I think just to add to that, Minister, if I may, I think that um, irrespective of how clear guidance is, you know, it's only whenever you've walked uh, through the experience that there are issues which will emerge that you know haven't necessarily been covered or covered with sufficient clarity in guidance and uh, you know we are seeing some of those issues emerge and there's uh, a lot of work going on to to address that provide that clear clarity uh, Ian and I have offered to do a, a series of zoom calls with school principals next week and the following week you know provide an opportunity to ask those questions that you want to ask that may not necessarily be covered in guidance uh, PHA are also working with EA colleagues to develop a frequently asked question section again to put up on the website which would hopefully again address this question but I think as you said in your introductory comments it is going to be I think just a bumpy couple of weeks as both parents teachers principals and everyone becomes used to uh, children being back at school and it's just a reflection of the genuine uh, anxiety that's out there and, and that's understandable and certainly we will continue to play our part to support colleagues in education and everyone in schools and parents and can I ask then just secondly about um, in a different avenue about the definition of clusters um, I know that currently two tests is considered a cluster, but is there some way of improving that messaging? Because I've had two examples over the summer, one in Crossgar um, and Ballon Hinch area and one in Newcastle, and the sort of sense of panic that follows the, the, the news headlines that there's a cluster in an area. People are literally closing their doors, pulling their curtains and not moving from the house. And, and the biggest impact there is obviously the economic impact on businesses who are losing out. And some of these businesses are right to the wire, very, very close. Um, and people are sort of saying that the definitions on the, um, on the website, which is sort of suggested by council area, well, certainly for Newry and Moore and down where we are, that's from just south of Belfast to the south parts of Armagh, and saying that there's 15 or 20 cases can sound like a lot, but you know, it's across 60, 70 miles. Uh, so is there any way at all of refining either that message or increasing the threshold of what, you know, can we say small cluster rather than large? I mean, is there any way that we can create some sort of um, perspective that would certainly help businesses who are really, really struggling with this at times? And I think, you know, Colin, and that's the balance about, you know, how you identify and, you know, how, how granular you put out your positive tests. Um, PHA does their, their weekly update in regards to local districts, uh, local district councils, and they actually do they actually do what you're asking for. But but as by local district council, they do outbreaks, and then outbreaks which are more than five. Mm -hmm. So there is that differentiation. But again, it doesn't go into pinpointing specific villages or towns because again, you know, it's what side, it's who, and it's where. And I think what we have seen is um, a good reaction to our test, trace and protect system. We're getting very good buy-in from the general public mm. because they're not being scared away from uh, engaging with that with that system. And there is a concern, and it, again, it's a psychological concern, if you start to identify certain areas, people become disenfranchised or don't want to engage with the test, trade and test, test trace and protect system. And that's especially, I, I suppose, in the concern of areas of those hard to reach um, individuals, you know, are or settled ethnic communities as well, which who, who we want to engage with our system. So what, should there be an area, and I think you know, we, we've seen two, we've seen one identified with a, a meat processing factory. We've seen one earlier um, in the Limavati area, you know, where we're seeing difficulties getting people to engage. Those are made public. Okay. Where we're seeing engagement with our test rate and protect system, PHA, I think, see the point. You know, would rather have people engaging with us on, on the confidential, reassured basis um, that they can do that. And I suppose, Chair, just to, just to highlight in regards to the work that you know, our test, trace and protect system is doing, it, it is performing actually actually very well um, at this moment in time. And, and again, you know, PHA put out the, the statistics in, in, the last, in the last week of the 313 cases who were identified to test, trace and protect, 
um, we were able to get in contact with 273 of those. That's 87 per cent. Now, compared to other, other systems across these islands, that's a high percentage of people engaging with us. Of those 273, we they identified an additional 856 contacts. So that's another 856 people who were identified as being a potential uh, a potential risk from COVID. Of that 856, 819 responded to test, trace and protect, 96% returned. So we're getting good buy-in from that piece of work and the same with the app that we're seeing as well. You know, there's good, good engagement with that too. So that system, that ability to break the chains of, of COVID, of transmission is working well for us. But again, you know, it's when, and, and, and I know what the, you know, the incident I remember it well, it's when social media, it's when somebody gets the hold of a story that they blow out of proportion that there's, there's adverse effects. So um, I think what I'm saying is, you know, if there's need for an alert in a certain area, it will come out from the public health agency. Okay, thank you, Minister. And Minister, is the app now available to under 18s? The, the app is not yet available to, to under 18s, Chair, but it is, in, it is in product development, but should be within the next next couple of weeks. And again, that will be, will be a first, um, uh, that there's an app available for under 18s. The reason it wasn't is because of, of data protection concerns that we had. And again, if you know, someone under, I think it's a 16, downloading an app, they need parental consent. Uh, we're working through that. We're working with... Uh, the, the Children's Commissioner to make sure all those reassurances are in place because one of the things I think we did, and, and again, the, the concerns that were raised by the committee in regards would it be a centralised or decentralised app, I think because of the approach that we took, um, so it has, has, has seen a large uptake. I know we've, I think at the last count, 328,000 uh, people have downloaded, downloaded the app in Northern Ireland. Now that's over 18, and we expect when we do have the under 18 app that will that will increase significantly. So, and it is working. Um, 279 um, people have been identified via the app, and they have released another 475 notifications via the app. Will it be a separate app or just a? It, it a will it'll page. work through the same system, but it will have different language uh, and different parental consents um, that are needed before people can actually use and put in their phones. Should they be under the age that needs it? Okay, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Minister. Um, you both th uh, correctly thank the health care workers, um, and we're really indebted to them for all the work they've done to keep people safe um, and alive you know, throughout this uh, period. Uh, I wonder, um, Minister, if you have any views on the RCN. Um, they've called for a 12.5% pay increase. Um, I certainly believe it's warranted in any case, but especially the work that they've been doing throughout a pandemic. Um, and considering the fact that uh, we're likely to see uh, a significant pay increase for uh, MLA constituency staff. I think it's only right and, and fair and proper that the, the nurses and indeed all health care workers get a, get a fair wage. So I'd just like to hear uh, the Minister's view uh, on that. Um, dental services, obviously, we, we've had a lot of uh, correspondence and uh, issues and worries about dental services. Um, I think some of those issues are still remaining. Um, just to flag with the Minister, there, there's a real concern in my constituency about as, um, uh, dental uh, operators going private, and there's one in particular uh, that is flagged that it uh, will go private and possibly more in the future. So I think I have to, uh, I would have to raise that with you. Uh, and just finally, on the, I mean, obviously the R rate um, has shot up in the last few weeks and months in new cases. Uh, I think it's 400 odd in the last uh, week, I think, and obviously tragically more more deaths. Um, my recollection from from March time. Was that, um, and certainly we were led to believe. Uh, my recollection was that if the R rate was above one, then we needed to either rethink um, lockdown or elements of it. Um, so I'd like to ask the minister: uh, Would you have any concerns that we're moving too quickly? Um, and it seems to be, uh, from, from certainly my uh, perspective and, and some others, that things are moving too quickly. Um, Effectively, everything is is more or less open, if you will, apart from wet bars, as you as you indicated, uh, and you said yourself, Minister. There's a potential for a, another full-scale assault. So uh, I'm just concerned that we've moved too quickly, and the result of that has been the R rate uh, increasing, and the amount of cases increasing, and tragically some some deaths. And and just finally, uh, what is what is the assessment from maybe um, the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer uh, about the virus over the next few weeks? I mean, obviously. 
there's an element of unpredictable, uh, unpredictability about it, but there's patterns across the world. How, how does this, uh, how does a view that this virus is potentially going to spread over the next few weeks and months? Thank you. Um, well, thanks, Jerry. In regards to you know, uh, RCN's position for 12.5% across all Agenda for Change, um, it is an Agenda for Change. It's a UK national call as well. So you know, part of that part of that conversation. Um, we're prepared to, to be part of it. We are we are part of it. Uh, and again, I, th I think it, you know the recognition that we gave uh, and still have to give our healthcare workers through the pandemic is vital. That we do keep them in that position that they rightly deserve. You know, I've, I've said this before. I've said this in this committee. You know, for too long, you know, they were the Cinderella service that we relied on without realising the the true value of them. Um, and I think that's one of the important points when we reflect back to to January, where we were able to get this place back together was actually because of the pressures that came from that sector and recognising uh, our health service workforce and our nursing workforce. So it is there. It's, a, it's the conversation that's been had at a national level, and I think it's one that, the, that, that I'll continue to push for as well. But it's also the, the recognition that we do have to give, and I've said this before to you, is to our domiciliary and care home staff as well, because you know, for too long they've been, they've, they've been not left out, but they've often been left behind. So it's about making sure we get that recognition as well. Um, in, in regards to dental practices, again, um, the, the concern about PPE, we, we made a further intervention um, of, of 3.8 million to allow dentists to, to source their own PPE because there are a number of avenues that they have been they have been able to use. The ongoing discussions, we, we know the emergency centres we've kept open uh, on a, I suppose, a much reduced basis as, as dentists start to re-engage their, with their own patients. The move from, um, uh, and again, I, d I don't know the detail of, of the one you're talking about. If you can give me you know, the specific, I'd be more than happy to, to look at it. But moving from uh, part national health or completely national health to private would be a concern because most dentists actually work and survive on the balance of both. Um, so it would concern me that we further reduce our national health service dental provision because it is vital for those, those individuals who, who do need it. Um, in regards to 2R, um, and I think we've said, you know, again, we, we produced and released the R paper on, on a Thursday. We are sitting at 1.3. Um, that's steady from last week, so it's not gone down, but it has remained steady for, for the second week in a row. Um, so it is above where we would like to see it, but on, on balance and in proportion to, to the steps that the executive um, are taken in regards to restriction on regulation. Um, I, I think we're currently proportionate in, in what we're doing. Um, I don't want to go to a further lockdown. I don't want to see the, the measures that we had to use uh, previously reintroduced. And again, that's when I suppose our continuing ask goes to the members of the general public. You know, social distancing, good hand hygiene, good respiratory hygiene, <coughs> and wear a face covering uh, where applicable. The, the increase in, in cases over the last seven days, again, um, is a concern um, because what we are now now seeing, which is a difference, um, is a difference to what we'd seen, you know, at, at the very early outbreaks. We're seeing that younger cohort um, actually testing more positive, and again, it does, you know, it, it is a reflective of complacency, but it's also reflective that's the age group that is now going back into social interaction, but also going back into work. So, it, you know, we're asking people again, you know. You, you know, be cautious, use you know, and use your common sense in regards to the asks that we make. Um, in regards to you know that that younger cohort, um, again, uh, chair, we've updated uh, information that's going to be available from today's um, dashboard, which will break it down um, into age group. Um, and over the last seven, it's, it will be done by a seven-day average. Uh, over the last seven days, 60% of those testing positive are younger than 39 which is a complete flip from what we'd have seen in, in the first outbreak. So it, it's that message to younger people, you know, please, please, please take care of yourself, but because by taking care of yourself, you're looking after your loved ones. Um, Ian or Michael, I, th I think in regards to, to the virus and Jerry's last question, I think. So um, we do monitor very carefully the progress of the epidemic. R is important, but I think we've been clear that once cases are at a lower level, that R is just one factor that we need to take into account. It's, all, it's inevitable that as, we that as we introduce relaxations, 
and people interact more, that we'll see more cases. I think that's unavoidable. And each time there are relaxations, we need a couple of weeks to assess the impact of those relaxations, to see what the new number of cases is and the age distribution of it and the extent to which it's leading to impacts on the health and social care system. Um, at the moment, while the number of cases has gone up substantially, 15-fold from early July, the number of hospital admissions um, and the number of seriously ill people has remained at a much lower level than during the first part of the epidemic. And that is because, as ministers indicated, at this point in time, the cases have switched round. We're seeing them in younger people who may still suffer serious consequences from COVID. It's not a trivial illness, but generally don't end up in hospital. Um, our big concern will be if we begin to see more cases occurring in the over 60s in particular, because that's what will lead through to hospital admissions and, and deaths. And we think that um, it's inevitable. Younger people do mix with older people. They see parents are older, they see grandparents. And that's why we need younger people just to be really careful. So yes, we can open up, but we need to make sure that everybody <coughs> sticks to the basic messages that they become embedded and that we live with the virus, which is what's going to have to happen through this winter. We're going to have to live with the virus. It's not going to disappear. I think the only thing to add to that, I, mean, I think it's very important that you know, the virus hasn't gone away, it isn't going to go away, and it is about adapting our behaviour to live safely with the virus and minimise the risk. These are finely balanced judgments for the executive we've discussed many times here at the committee. The disproportionate impact that uh, this virus has had on those socioeconomically deprived uh, communities from socioeconomic deprived backgrounds, black, Asian, ethnic minority groups, uh, this virus disproportionately impacts on, on, on poorer people. Um, and it is important that we are mindful of the fact that there are significant health inequalities and inequalities more generally in our society, and those can only but be exasperated, exas exacerbated by uh, the current uh, restrictions that we have seen. Um, it has impacted very significantly on children's educational opportunities, potentially their life opportunities, um, employment, livelihoods have been put at risk, as we've heard. Uh, so it is important that we take a balanced approach to this whilst trying to press down hard in the virus. I suppose the only uh, couple of points uh, to add are the, the fact that it is unlike um, phase, uh, the first wave of this uh, at this present moment in time, where, as, as Ian has said, you know, at this stage, 40 to 50 per cent of cases were in those uh, over, uh, over 60 years of age. We're seeing about 10 per cent of cases over 60 years of age. So that demonstrates that uh, the behavioural aspects, the adhering to the messages, are being heeded more by older individuals who are at greater risk than perhaps uh, those under the age of 39 years of age. And that's not to demonise uh, individual uh, sections of our community, it's just a, a reality of the, I suppose, the frequency of social contact. I suppose the only final point then to make uh, is that the executive did move swiftly when we saw our go above one and reintroduced some of the restrictions in relation to household contacts. Uh, gatherings in private dwellings and gardens in relation to numbers of people and numbers of households, going from 10, a uh, number of 10, from four different households from, to six, from two different households, and also then uh, ensuring that risk assessments were carried out in all gatherings, uh, either indoors or outdoors, over 15, whereas previously that was 30. Um, the executive had previously considered the requirement uh, for more localised restrictions, but thankfully up to this point in time, that has not been necessary, but does remain something that uh, Minister and the uh, Executive colleagues uh, will consider if required. Um, just before I go to Alex, could I ask, um, you know, in terms of the messaging, it's obviously, it is very complicated for people to keep on top of all the changes as we go forward and then we go back in steps. That's difficult. And then balancing uh, the obsession um, of, you know, listening to all things COVID, 24/7, which is really unhealthy. Um, how do, you know? How do you balance that? Is there a better way to get the message out without people having to um, obsess and constantly listen to the messages going out? I, I think it is. It is that point, um, Chair, and it's one of the reasons that we, as a, as a department, reintroduced, you know, the, the weekly, weekly press briefings, because those are those are heard. 
Um, we're doing, you know, we're doing it on a week now because it is. I, I'm not saying that's enough, but it's starting to reinforce the message that that we need people to hear, uh, and it has come back to the simple messages we used at the beginning: social distancing, good hand hygiene, good respiratory hygiene, and now the addition of, of wearing face coverings. So it's about getting that into people's heads, people's mindsets. We are seeing an increase of people starting to do that again, um, and I think one of the points, uh, and going back to Jerry's uh, point as well, you know about. You know, are what have we done? Uh, it was the engagement, I think, as well. Where we've always had powers and regulations, but it was about the enforcement. Uh, and I think the latest update we had was the PSNI have now interacted, uh, and our um, I, I think 18. Eight, 18 notices of prohibition mm -hmm. on bars and licensed premises. Mm -hmm. So we weren't. Um, that wasn't necessary before. We weren't seeing that bef before, but now that that step is being taken, I think it re-emphasises re re uh, the messaging. Thank you, um, Alex. Thank you, um, thank you, Minister, for your presentation, and thank you for doing all you and the staff are doing to try and keep us all safe. Um, one area where I have major concern um, about COVID is. What I'm saying, um, I'm trying to be diplomatic how you say it, <laughs> um, the messaging that we're getting out is not being listened to by a significant minority of the population. Um, and you see it with face masks. Um, if you're going to shop, you'll, you'll, you'll see any number of people just ignoring that. Um, but what's concerning me even more is that whenever we get a potential vaccine, um, I certainly will be the first in the queue to get the vaccine, uh, so I volunteer. Uh, and that's because I want to protect my mother and father because they're elderly uh, and they're not well. Um, and I have faith. Um, can you tell us where we are with the vaccine um, and how we're going to get that message out? Because I, I, I did put publicly out there that I would take it. Um, but the reaction I got back from a significant amount of them was that it's not going to be safe. Um, it's going to cause illness. Um, it hasn't been tested for long enough, um, and even down to, you know, conspiracy theories of control. Just some, some, some of it was absolutely crazy. But um, I, I think we're going to have a big problem selling the vaccine. Um, what plans have we got to be able to do that? Because the only way we're going to get on top of this totally is through a safe vaccine. Yeah. No, no, and thanks, Alex. And I, I can assure you, if some of the messaging you got when you put out about using a, but you would take the vaccine, you should see some of the stuff I get. <laughs> uh, and look, con conspiracy. It, it's amazing what what is, is being promoted, and sometimes being promoted by by elected representatives. But uh, not me. Uh, no, 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 not 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 you. Yeah, but <laughs> um, you know, there is a concern there. It, it's not even in the message, but sometimes the messenger can cause. Can cause difficulty and undermine undermine the message that the department and the executive uh, are putting out as well. And again, it is that significant minority, and I think you, you phrased that actually quite well because it is a, a significant minority, but they're vocal. Yeah. And my, my concern is, and it's the same concern that you have that we share, is that they start to undermine the core message that we are putting out. So that's why it's the importance. Of keeping, you know, the, again, you know, good hand hygiene, social distance, and all that. They can't say it. We can't say it often enough. In regards to to the vaccine, I think it's been made clear uh, a number of times. The only way we get back to any sort of normal is through vaccine and widespread. But one of the things, and I'll use this opportunity, Chair, if you don't mind, is to push the flu vaccine mm. when it does start. Um, because we're doing a lot of work, we're doing work with GPs, community pharmacies, in a number of settings, to make sure we can get as high a flu uptake of the flu vaccine as we possibly can. Because we're already aware, you know, flu and COVID at the same time will be highly damaging, and highly challenging um, to, to to our health service as well. So, I'll use the opportunity you gave me in regards to the flu vaccines and the specifics for COVID vaccine. I leave that in the hands of. Ian and Michael as to you know, efficacy, uh, where we are in the development and how we need to ensure uptake. There are um, around 170 vaccines in development worldwide. Um, and the UK government has signed up to purchasing four separate vaccines um, in advance of the results of the significant clinical trials coming through. 
um, fairly large-scale clinical trials of a small number of the vaccines are underway, um, and it's intended to start trials of vaccination in the UK in the next few weeks. Um, I have signed up to participate in the clinical trials, um, which I absolutely wouldn't do if I didn't think it was safe. <laughs> um, and certainly, um, I will also be very early in the queue once a vaccine is properly um, available. Behind me. <laughs> um, you know, it's likely that when a vaccine becomes available for widespread use, and that will require two doses of vaccine about a month apart to achieve significant immunity from the early studies. And we're not sure how long that immunity will last, as we're not sure how long immunity lasts for those people who have experienced COVID. We know that there have now been several cases worldwide of people getting COVID for a second time, um, which indicates that immunity is not long term. So just because people have had the virus doesn't mean they're safe from getting the virus again. We've still a lot to learn about it. We don't think a vaccine will be available um, before sometime in 2021 in significant amounts. So it's very unlikely that we'll have a vaccine available for this winter, which is why, as I've said, we need to find a way of living with the virus, allowing as much activity as possible but everybody remaining as careful as possible um, not to become infected through using the mitigations we have described. I hope as many people as possible will take up the opportunity of vaccination when it becomes available. We will certainly um, use very positive messaging around that, but there will have been substantial assessment of the safety of the vaccination before that point is reached. I suppose the only thing to add to it is about the safety of the vaccine. There will be no vaccine available until it goes through the proper and appropriate regulatory framework, the MHRA uh, and uh, approval system, and also as recommended by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, uh, which is a body, scientific body independent of government, which advises all UK ministers on how vaccines should be administered, for instance, to, to what a particular group and the population who would benefit from uh, from it most. Uh, so again, those approval processes will be in place. And some of you will recall we had the same discussion uh, back in 2009, 2010 about the H1N1 uh, swine flu uh, vaccine, the same concerns uh, that were voiced in the public uh, around a, a new vaccine. That's understandable. And it's up to us to uh, provide the assurance to the public about the rigor of the testing and the trials that are underway and the approval system. Uh, we have um, links into, there's a UK-wide uh, vaccine uh, programme board, which we are fully linked into. I chair our um, Northern Ireland equivalent, um, and that is overseeing both, as Minister said, the seasonal flu vaccine programme, which is really going to be very challenging this year. You know, we've purchased a, a million doses of vaccine, that's over a quarter of a million more doses than we would in a normal seasonal flu. And we have the prospect, although not likely, uh, as Ian has said, of potentially then having to roll in very quickly and roll out uh, a COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccine uh, early in the new year. It's going to be immensely challenging. Um, I think you've already heard from general practitioners and their concerns about administration of the seasonal flu vaccines to tens of thousands of individuals in a socially distant way with uh, personal protective equipment. That will be challenging enough. Um, catching up on existing immunisation programmes in schools and elsewhere, and then um, you know, mounting what is going to be a phenomenally challenging exercise of a of a new vaccine for COVID-19. Thank, thank you for that, uh, Dr. McBride. Um, I'm very concerned about time. We have only about 15 minutes left. If you're strictly to your part of well, well, it's the executive chair. Um, but uh, look, I'll, I'll push it as long as I can because it is important for us to have the engagement chair. So appreciate that very much. We have another four members, so I'm suggesting perhaps four, five minutes per member. Um, sorry to do that, just to make sure everybody gets in with their question. Okay. Um, so we have uh, Orlea and then Pat. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair, and I'll try and be um, quick. My first question is around um, so the announcement around the new step down facility at White Abbey and the specialist centres in Ligon Valley and Ulster Hospital, would the department be able to provide us with the criteria that was used 
um, to determine where those facilities were going to be placed. Um, and I'm not sure if there's any plans um, for maybe um, an additional step down facility at some point, you know, um, later in the year or, or next year, um, for a facility elsewhere um, across across the north. So that's the, the first question. Well, I'll answer that yes, or that we can provide that. Oh, great. But we'll provide that as part of the rebuilding structure as well. There's no problem. Brilliant. Thank you. That was quick. Okay. <laughs> um, so and then so my second my second question. It, it's around in the context of it's already been touched on by yourselves and, and most of the speakers um, around the winter pressures and the messaging. And I heard um, Dr McBride this morning on the radio, obviously the important thing is around people being you know, sensible in the actions that we're taking as individuals. Um, and that is important, but I am concerned um, around, especially because you're going to, you have seen an increase in the amount of people that are coming forward for tests, which is a good thing if they're concerned, but a bad thing if they don't actually require you know, to have the test because then maybe you're taking it away from somebody else. Um, so I wanted to ask if, is the department tracking the, the figure of the amount of people who should be self-isolating after they've had a test or after they've travelled um, in or out of the country? And can we, I don't know if maybe it's possible to even look at another avenue of trend to, um, even if it's underneath the contact tracing team, but when we know the people that should be self-isolating, is there a way that we can be following up on that? Um, you know, more extensively, because what the worry is, there definitely is complacency out there at some levels, and maybe people who should be self-isolating might not always be doing it, and the worry is obviously then once we hit the winter season, um, then that could have an impact on, on a surge or, or a further um, spike. So I don't know if you're looking into that or if something could be done around that. Thank you. Um, or, or in regards to you know, the self-isolation uh, part, if they come through the contact tracing, um, System, you know, test trace and protect. There are some occasions you know, we do follow up calls or PHA does follow up calls just to make sure that you know it's like a check in to see how people are rather than enforcing to make sure they're 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 actually there. Yeah. Um, because I think one of the concerns that we had about making that an enforcement for um, uh, you know an enforcement point where you must self isolate or you're subject to a penalty mm -hmm. that it would prevent actually people coming forward if they thought they were going to be locked in their houses. So it's about that. That voluntary side of the general te test, 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 trace, um, but I think we have to find an easier test, name. Test, trace, protect. I have to find it. <laughs> That's one of those ones just doesn't stick. Uh, so we, we just want you know to, to make sure that people engage as, as much voluntarily with that. Where we have the enforcement is for those people who are travelling in from red countries. Mm -hmm. So that is where you must isolate for 14 days, and there's follow-up calls made, and I think we've already seen um, one, one of the newspapers carrying this morning a report from the PSNI where we've already seen a thousand pound fine uh, levied on somebody who had broken that. So it's about, I suppose, the two, two different avenues of enforcement. If you're coming through the test, trace and protect system, you've done it voluntarily. We want to encourage people to do that voluntarily. If you've come in from a red country, there's an enforcement part. So we're, we're, we're seeing good engagement with the voluntary side of self-isolation. And I think people who go forward for a test are doing it for the right reasons, so they're engaging with the rest of the advice as well. But again, you know, concern about messaging from the winter. I, I think it's important that we get that back into people's heads, and it just does. You know, it's just from our, from ourselves, from the executive, from the committee, you know, from MLAs. You know, just keep re rehearsing it, repeating it. We can't repeat it often enough, in my opinion. I was even just sorry, but the, the point that the small point that you made around um, having um, con catching COVID nineteen and the flu, yeah. you know whatever way you can put that to the public but just so you're showing the seriousness of yeah. it so yeah. you know that you know the the some of the myths that are out there around that it's not dangerous it's not deadly and if you have the flu and you catch it you know it's just to try and maybe do away with some of the complacency that that, that might have um set in at this yeah. stage no i appreciate that thank you pat okay thanks chair um minister the uh, increases in the number of infections is worrying there's no doubt about that but <coughs> Apart from the issues that Callum raised at the start about testing for kids and when they should get tested, going to school and so on, those are the only issues that have been raised with me recently by constituents. But I have a long list of other issues that have been raised. Someone with a, a highly elevated PSA test just at the start of the lockdown who requires further investigation still hasn't been able to get it. Uh, another constituent who had an ECG carried out by his GP told normally the results come back in three to four weeks because of COVID, it might take seven or eight weeks. 
has now been waiting uh, 13 or 14 weeks. Uh, a 78 year old constituent with chronic diarrhea can't get further investigation. Uh, a wom young woman who needs uh, surgery for uh, endometriosis, another uh, young woman who needs surgery for scoliosis, uh, another woman who has uh, suffered chronic infection, uh, bladder and kidney infection, and has uh, uh, contracted sepsis on a number of occasions, actually had her breast bone broken while CPR was being administered, hasn't seen her consultant in two years. So while we're focused on COVID, all these other uh, conditions are worsening uh, and people aren't getting the treatment they need. I'm, I'm not asking a question, I'm just making a statement about that. We need to focus on these other issues too. I have two quick fire questions. Uh, one is about Mucklemore, and we see in the press this week that it has, it has cost an extra 12 million uh, to put in place uh, emergency measures as a result of the scandal that has happened there. When you were uh, leader of the Ulster Unionist Minister, you signed a petition calling for a full-blown public inquiry. Is it not past time now that you announced a full-blown public inquiry with powers to compel witnesses uh, and uh, documentation uh, and, and allow the families to find out what went wrong, who was responsible uh, and where the fault lay in the system? And secondly, uh, Tony Stevens has been appointed as the interim chief executive of the RQIA. And you're probably aware that the RQIA has been tasked to carry out some reviews into the issues around neurology in the Belfast Trust. Tony Stevens, and I don't want in any way to impugn Tony Stevens' professional integrity, but Tony Stevens was medical director in the Belfast Trust when a lot of these misdiagnoses were taking place. So is there not a conflict of interest there in having uh, the former medical director of the Belfast Trust as chief executive of the RQIA, which is involved in carrying out reviews into that whole scandal. Um, and Pat, in, in regards to, to your first uh, I suppose your, your first statement, it, it, it's a concern to us all in regards to you know, the number of cases, number of individuals who are waiting longer than they should. If there's any of those you want to pass through to ourselves, we'll get them into the trust so we can we can look at them for them just to make sure they are getting the attention they deserve and they're not being lost uh, in the system. In regards to, to Muckamore, um, you know, I visited Muckamore, I've met the families. I, I signed that letter as uh, party leader. Um, I know Paula has brought, there's a debate on Tuesday, so if, I, I'll respond to the debate because I don't want to take away from giving the House's place. Not, not that I'm denying you, Pat, or denying the families. I've said I'm, I will follow up on an inquiry. And I'll make that announcement to the Assembly where we are that there's more, I, I suppose, I, I'm waiting on further advice coming back from today with a number of cases uh, that are now in front of the, the PPS as well through the PSNI investigations as well. So, no, no that, look, it's, it's a commitment I made, Pat, and you should know me well enough now, but by I make a commitment, I make a promise, I stick by it. It's not in my nature to do anything else. So, I'll, I'll come back to you, and I'm sure you'll be there on Tuesday when Paula brings, brings that debate. In regards to, to Tony Stevens' appointment in, in RQIA, it's a temporary appointment. Tony's in there for three to six months while we appoint a full full time chief executive. Uh, and as you say, you know you know, know Tony, I know Tony well from his work in the Northern Trust. Uh, there's no way it would be in his character either to jeopardise any work that the RQIA is doing. So I'll, I'll seek reassurance that there is separation between his post and any involvement uh, and the concerns that, that you is because you know as a temporary nature of the position is there at this moment in time and Tony I don't think there's any question that there'll be any sort of or interference or should there be. Okay. Uh, we have Paula next. Uh, we're not getting any <coughs> she's muted. I think you're muted. Hello? Yeah. Yes, you know I, thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. And, and one of the benefits of going so late is that a lot of my questions have been asked. Apologies, I'm not there. I've got a head cold at the minute, and I don't think it's at all appreciate me sneezing on you. Um, Minister, to come back to the issue around the fair pay for nurses, when are the nurses who were on strike um, earlier this year who you promised would get a reimbursement of their docked pay, when will they be getting that money? The second issue is it regarding the students who are now returning into the Holy Lands and parts of um, inner Belfast. 
and the house parties that have started and the police are having to respond to those. And I'm just wondering how you're going to be working with the universities in terms of robust messaging and also then follow up testing because the threat for community transmission when they go back into their communities at the weekend is fast. And the third issue is in relation to the New Nightingale um, step down facility in White, White Alley Hospital. While I think it's a great idea, I'm just wondering what happened with the step down centre in the Ramada Hotel in Talbot Street. As you know, it cost £150,000 to um, refurbish that, and it was quite problematic, and then reinstate that as a hotel. And I'm just wondering, was there a robust business plan around that? That's a lot of public money that was spent on that. Why was it closed down? And are we certain that White Abbey Hospital is the best place for this new facility? Thank you. In regards to the first point, that's actually currently an issue that's with uh, the executive. I think it was actually Jerry asked me the last time we were in uh, the assembly as to where that, uh, that, that, that position and that decision actually stands. There's a repercussive <laughs> nature of a change in policy should a department uh, reimburse strike pay. Uh, it would then fall the way the, way the nature of, the, of that decision would, be work, would work out. Would that if any other minister wanted to reimburse strike pay, it would be the Department of Health would carry the financial burden, and that's the repercussive nature um, of that decision. Um, so me being responsible, my officials being responsible for, for our health budget, want the reassurance from the executive that my department and the Department of Health will not carry the repercussive nature uh, or the repercussive costs uh, should, that, uh, should that happen elsewhere or at another time. In regards to, to students return to the Holy Land, again, and I'm not, I don't think I'm breaking any confidence when that was actually raised uh, at the executive this morning. Uh, so with a discussion between ourselves, between economy and justice, in regards to the proactive coordinated steps that can be taken between uh, PSNI, PHA, uh, mm. the universities, but also Belfast City Council as well, about getting the messaging um, out to those students as well. And again, it's about the counter thing, Paula, as well. While wet bars are closed and the right thing to do, <coughs> students are going to have house parties. Well, students will have house parties even if the wet bars are open, but it's how we get that messaging through that it has to be. You know, I was going to say how it has to be responsible, but I think our student population um, need the message, need the support, and need the encouragement to be responsible. Uh, you know, we're seeing students moving in now. I think it's a fortnight in advance of the actual return to universities. So, if we can get them as they come back to their residences, I think would be a, the, the, the proper thing to do. Uh, in, in regards to to the Ramada step down facility, that was a project that was taken forward by the Belfast Trust. Uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't actually a regional facility. Um, so, I, I, if you want to, or we can follow up with the Belfast Trust in regards to. To the work around that, in regards to the Nightingale facility, you know we had looked, and I don't know if you recall at one point there was talk about the Econ Centre and another, another, a number of other uh, possible locations when we were looking at the first Nightingale, um, White Abbey as part of our estate. Um, so it's actually about you know utilising what we have. But as I said, in, in regards to all this question, we're quite prepared to sell or to share. Um, what information we have in regards to that and the robustness as part of, of the planning going forward. Okay. Alan? Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, uh, I, I couldn't start to compete uh, in terms of the negative emails or the social media comment that you and your team have been receiving over recent months, uh, but uh, there does seem to be a small army of, of people out there who seem to be spending their every waking moment, uh, or maybe even style themselves as uh, barrack room lawyers, who are looking for loopholes, they're looking for contradictions, they're looking for uh, the difficulty of enforcement of all the regulations that you have been bringing through to try and protect the public. And there's two issues really, there's the letter of the law and there's the spirit of the law, and I think most of us recognise that the regulations have been brought in in emergency circumstances. They haven't been subject to the same scrutiny, but they are there to protect uh, the best interests and the health uh, of the public. And then there's another small army of people that uh, uh, I notice they, they write letters to the papers. They also <laughs> demonstrate, they were in Dublin last week, demonstrate, and they demonstrate in London. And uh, 
they seem to think that this is the whole thing, COVID thing, is a worldwide governmental conspiracy, despite the fact that I think it was the latest figures, maybe 25 million people throughout the world have contracted the, uh, the, the virus. Um, so I'm just wondering, do you have a message for those people? And the other thing is, uh, just uh, not related to that, but in terms of the, um, the pubs, and I know the police have served, I think it's 18 closure notices, um, there are publicans uh, throughout the country uh, who really are driving a horse and cart through the regulations, and I have no doubt that the police will maybe eventually work their way around to serving a closure no a notice on them. But is there a message for publicans that uh, if they do continue to break the rules, even if the police don't knock their door and serve a closure notice on them, that it could have long-term implications for the renewal of their, of their licences? Okay. I'll, I'll, um, and thanks. In regards to you know, the letter and the spirit of the law, you know, I think you've hit the nail on the head. You know, the majority of the people in Northern Ireland, and the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland, always do the right thing, want to do the right thing, because they know that it is about saving lives and protecting their loved ones. Um, for that, that cohort, you know, and come back, that significant minority, um, the phrase that, that Alex used, you know, that significant minority will always be there. But what I would say to them is, think of the danger you're causing. You know, when I see people protesting, um, and they have the right to protest. But when you see it, and, uh, and it's this automatic reaction now, when you see they're less than two metres apart, when you see they're not wearing face coverings, <laughs> you just know, do you realise the danger you're doing to yourself? But not just to yourself, but to your loved ones as well. And I think that's what has carried the majority of, of Northern Ireland to the position where we got to a few months ago, where we seen where we were in July and August with very low number of positive cases, low hospital admissions. It's because people were doing the right thing. They didn't need to read the regulations. They didn't need to read the letter of the law because they knew what the spirit of it was meant to actually do, and that was to save lives. And that's, that, that's where we want to be, because by, by saving lives, by, by supporting uh, our, our, our COVID response, we get back to addressing the issues that Pat raised in regards to all those people who need all those follow-ups, who need, who need the scans, who need the scans read, who need you know, the, the surgeries as well. So what I say to them, you know, your, your influence, your effect, your actions, does have an effect on other people's health, whether directly or indirectly. So you know, I, I, I'll paraphrase or I'll actually quote the chief medical officer. I'll tell them to wise up. I'll ask them to wise up. I'll say to them, you know, that, you know have, an, have, have a respect uh, for other people. Now, I would say my social media accounts now have gone through the roof having told them to do that, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, it's what I do as, as health minister. You know, it's, it's what the message I need to get out there. Um, in regards to, to pubs and especially wet bars, um, who I feel for the most are those <coughs> responsible publicans who are currently closed and seeing their businesses suffering because they are doing what they're meant to be doing at this moment in time. If there was a way I could reverse um, and close down those rogue elements who are open at this minute in time and allow those legitimate, responsible pub owners to open, I would do it. Um, the, the executive is, is re-engaging this afternoon, and I, well, it's, it's being discussed. Um, it's, it's not up to me to preempt any announcement coming from, from the executive. But it's not also, also in, it's the part that we have to pay um, notice to as well. Uh, some of our local pubs just aren't about people going in and getting drunk. There's a social aspect to them as well, especially in the small local rural communities where you know it, it, it's, a, it's the only means of social interaction people have. So in, in regards to those people who are breaking the law, and yes, the police have enforced 18 notifications, um, and again, members of the general public are reporting pubs who are breaking regulations. There's also all their publicans and members of bars reporting all their publicans and member owners of bars because they know it is having a long-term adverse impact on their businesses. So it's about, again, it's about the responsible nature. It's about working with the Department of Health, working with the executive so that we can get as much of society reopened as possible because we know the good that it brings. Thank you very much, and I think, Minister, that's a very good. After your time is gone, it's a very good note to to end on uh, that message that actually, if we if we follow the guidelines and the regulations, 
do what we all know what we need to do. Actually, that helps the economy. It allows you to open more and it allows you to resume health services, which is of vital importance. But can I thank you, each and every one of you, for your, your time this afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's been uh, very useful. I know there's there's many um, subjects and questions we didn't get through, but no doubt we'll we'll um, get you the wrong class with those. Uh, for again, I wish you all the best for the rest of your executive meeting today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McBride, and to Professor Young and to Minister Small. Yeah. Thank you. Chair, can I just say uh, again thanks for the committee. You know, I say we'll be back sometime, probably sooner. Uh, rather than later, I would think, because there are a number of, of issues that we need to bring back and have discussions um, with the committee. I thank the committee for their support, uh, not just of the department, but of our health, health and social care family. And again, I thank the members around this chamber and around this table for continuing to push out the message that we need people to hear, um, because it does need to be heard. So, Chair, thank you very much for, for your support and the work that the work that we have been doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, members. Uh, okay, so there are several items of correspondence from the department included um, under this agenda item at tabs 5.8 to 5.11 of the pack. Item 5.8 relates to dentistry, and there's a number of related items under correspondence, so I propose that we deal with those together at that point. Item 5.9 is similar in dealing with RQIA, which will also arise under correspondence. Uh, do members have any comments to make on item 5.10, or members content to note? Content to note. Okay. Sorry, um, we're on table pack, sorry, are we? No, this is the main pack. This is the main pack for now. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, do members have any comments on item 5.11? Or members content to note pending further scrutiny of care home issues at a later date? Intent. Intent. Okay. Um, item 5.12 is report of the Rapid Learning Initiative. Uh, if members have any comments on that at this stage? And if not, um, if members are content to note. Um, uh, all those issues un until those um, come up again and as we go through our work programme. So if there's no suggestions, that's grand. I, I'm going to propose that we take a, a short break of 10 minutes now um, and uh, we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland... OK, Member, so I um, just advise you we're returning to item two in the agenda, which is Chair's business. I would skip on there to deal with the Minister. So the um, Chair and myself met informally with the Minister, the CMO and CSO, um, in the last number of days for an informal um, chat through, which was very useful. Uh, and then we move on to item three, which is the draft minutes. I refer members to the, the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 23rd of July, which are at tab 3.1 of the meeting pack. Members content with the minutes? Content. content. Thank you. And then on to matters arising. There are no matters arising, so that takes us to, on to item seven then, which is correspondence. Oh, sorry, six first. Uh, six, we have the SR 2020 uh, forward slash 139, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Number 11 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. I can inform members that the Department has advised that this SR has now been revoked by SR 2020 forward slash 150, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 Regulations, NI 2020, which will come before the committee uh, next week. So I therefore propose that this item be deferred until next week, pending the committee's decision on SR 2020 forward slash 150. Everybody's happy with that? Great. Okay, thank you. So now we're on to item seven, which is the correspondence. Uh, I refer members to uh, tab seven of the pack and, and the table papers and to the correspondence memo at 7.1. I draw your attention to several items Item 5.9, included with your papers for the Minister's briefing, is a Minister's response to committee concerns regarding the terms of reference for the independent review of the RQIA board resignations. There are two other items of correspondence concerning the RQIA. Item 7.5 is an update from the Minister regarding non-executive appointments to the board of the RQIA. Item 7.6 is from the Minister advising the committee of the new appointment of the new interim chief executive of the RQIA. Any comments regarding these items? Sure. Could I um, well, yeah. just make a suggestion? Um, 7.5 and 7.6. Um, I wonder if 
we would be able to, if the committee um, would be able to write off to the department um, asking um, who are the two DOH officials um, that have been appointed to the RQIA board and do their positions um, in work have any connection to RQIA um, or a regulatory service? Um, and if they expressed an interest or were they approached, it's just to maybe just get some more detail around those appointments if other committee members are content to try, try and um, get that detail. Chair, could I just come in on the back of that? You know, it, it, it's, it's strange that uh, officials from the department should be appointed to the board of the RQIA, given that the RQIA is supposedly independent from the department. Uh, it's, it's, it's a worrying trend, and, and I accept it's a short-term appointment, uh, just as the Minister made clear about uh, the appointment of the Interim Chief Executive. But it's, it's not a good precedent to set, uh, and, and I accept the circumstances in which uh, the appointments have been made arose out of a, uh, an unprecedented situation almost. But uh, you know, as a committee, I think we should be expressing our concern about that uh, crossover between the department and an independent body. Any other comments, Members I, I don't disagree with that. I, I think that that you know, in, in a healthy situation, uh, that's the way it should be. But I, I think also we we'll have to be uh, cognizant of the situation that we find ourselves in now. That you know, we are in this sort of emergency sort of situation and we're doing things that we normally wouldn't consider doing uh, because of the, the emergency nature of it. And I think it was maybe important uh, that there's no vacuum left uh, in these organisations and uh, it may be that, that they are just uh, the, the appointments of expediency uh, to put some sort of structure in place uh, rather than leave a vacuum. I think a vacuum would be just as maybe, maybe more dangerous uh, than having the sort of situation that, that Pat alluded to, but I, I totally agree with him. Normal circumstances, it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be acceptable, and we shouldn't accept something like that. But I think I'd be prepared to, you know, to give it a bite ball on, on this occasion, uh, given that it is a short-term uh, situation. Okay, um, Paula. Um, I, yeah, I, I, notwithstanding everything people have said there, I'm just wondering, is there um, an opportunity to invite the new interim chief executive back to the committee to give us an update on their work? Uh, as we see the numbers rising again, I think it would be opportune for us to get a handle on how they're supporting the care homes in dealing with this going forward in terms of inspections as well. So I suppose it's, it's a, a, a separate um, suggestion, but in some ways it might give us some comfort around the scrutiny role that we have as a committee. Okay, Colin? Yeah, it's just following on. I mean, you know, North sort of Quango Kingdom, like there's that many different Quangos for everything. I'm sure they could have found the members that weren't connected uh, with the department because it is very fundamental. The RQIA is there to go when required and assess any concerns about care being delivered, which is being delivered by um, the trusts and the department. So it is a bit of the gamekeeper and um, the, the hunter coming together there. And, and I think we just need to be um, sort of suggesting, OK, it is an emergency situation, but in the whole landscape that we have with literally hundreds and hundreds of people involved in Quangos, that we have to take two people from the very organisation that may need to be held to account. And if we revisit why we have the problems, um, a lot of the problems that were the, the board felt that they had to step down was because of the over-involvement of the department in the day-to-day -day running of the RQIA, and now we have two of those officials there. So it, it just doesn't sit right, and I think it may be something that could be revisited. Okay, Jerry? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I mean, I agree with Orlean and, and Pat and Collins and others' points about concern, and I have no reason to be judge or... 
uh, dispute or call into question the, the Department of Health people, but there's a bit of an attitude at getting the same pool of people uh, to sort of investigate, if not the department, then the connections that the department has in terms of care. Um, so I, I think there is there's a dangerous precedent being followed around that, and <laughs> certainly a list of people that I know in terms of families and people who uh, advocate for people in care homes who would do well, I think, on the RQIA uh, board, to be perfectly honest. But I think there's a dangerous precedent being set, and I think we should, we should raise concerns about it. Okay, any further comments? So we are content to write on the issue, obviously. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot in there, uh, including Paula's uh, suggestion that we invite uh, someone to come and actually speak to committee, which I think would be very useful. Um, Clark, what do you think in terms of... Um, I'm just not sure that I have a clear steer. We've had a number of suggestions, so I think we would need some of the members concerned to put a proposal to the committee for, and get the committee's agreement on the exact line. So we've heard concerns, we've heard reference and acknowledgement to exceptional circumstances, and we've heard a suggestion to invite. So those are kind of separate categories. The first then is the committee's position, if you want to clarify that. I think Arlea had the first proposal, didn't you? Um, yeah, well, it was just teasing out um, some of the detail around the process of the appointments. Um, and I know that there's the Commissioner for Public Appointments as well. Um, you know, we could maybe send a letter off to, for clarification to, um, to that body um, with those questions, if, if that makes it any easier. Just yeah. So I've got a record of those questions, if the, the committee's content. Right, that's the first one then. Are we content with that as a proposal to uh, put those queries to the department? Um, and then, um, Paula, do you want to make a separate proposal to actually invite yeah, someone to come? I don't think it's an either or. I think that um, it should really be part of our work programme of inviting them back to give an update because it was probably about three or four months ago since they last presented to the committee. Chair, could, could I also uh, say, I mean, I think it would be worth flagging up concerns of the committee about the appointment of the two officials. I mean, I've already raised the issue of the conflict of interest that the new interim chief executive may have. Uh, I just think it's important that we mention to the minister that it's a situation where we understand we're, we're in a difficult situation. Uh, if, if this was to happen again, we, we would uh, maybe take a more serious view of it, or it shouldn't happen on a regular basis, or if someone can come up with, with uh, more appropriate or better wording for that. Okay, so the committee, does the committee wish to uh, raise concerns about appointments while acknowledging difficult, difficult circumstances? Mm -hmm. Or do you want do you want to be as specific to say something around uh, that the committee is concerned at um, a potential conflict well, I don't of interest? Think that, that there's nothing much that we can do about the current appointments for three months, and by the time anything happens, it's the three months going to be up. I think maybe where Pat's coming from is yes, we reluctantly accept and appreciate the situation, and it is it's it is what it is, but. Going forward, it's not an acceptable way to do things. I think that's yeah. really the message we we'll want to convey. That whilst we're content to let it sit this time, it's it's something yeah, that can't happy. be yeah. can't be allowed in the future. Yeah, I think that's useful, Alan. Thank you, um, because I think you're right. You know, it could take you much of that time just to get a response. I think as part of the public appointment process, there's a clear question about conflict of interest, and we have an issue here where the, the interim appointment is somebody that potentially is going to oversee something that he may have been involved in, and then we have two appointments from the department to an organisation which is supposed to hold the, de the department to account. So there are obvious conflicts of interest in straightforward ministerial appointments that may not have made it through the whole public appointment process. So I think maybe we are saying, yeah, OK, we understand that because you're in an emergency situation, but I, that wouldn't normally hold up in ordinary times. So um, get, get the 
a round of appointments done as quickly as possible. Okay. Well, I think we have enough there then um, to, to word a letter on that. Okay. okay. That's great. Okay, we shall uh, move on then to uh, item 5.8 of the pack. Minister's response to the committee's letter following the briefing from the Chief Dental Officer on the 9th of July. Item 7.36 in table papers is a copy of correspondence from an individual dentist to General Dental Services at HSCB, expressing her concerns that she will have to deregister a large number of patients due to financial strain. So, has have any of members any comments on that particular on any of either of those particular items? Chair? Just, just briefly, Chair. I mean, I, I raise it with the Minister. There's a concern about more uh, practices having to go fully private. Uh, uh, my sister's a dentist, so will declare an interest. But I think there's a concern about the future of NHS dentistry, people being charged. Uh, my understanding is um, it's around um, if you're paying for your service and you're going to an NHS dentist, you're paying about £8 for a filling. That can be upwards of £80 for a fully private um uh, uh, treatment and a fully private a patient uh, at a private service. So I think getting that message out, not to scare people, but to say, listen, the NHS dentistry is under threat. And if it goes or if it's seriously undermined, then there's a massive impact, obviously, in the NHS, but a, an increase in cost for people. So I just think we need to, you know, the committee's done well uh, in the previous weeks um, on the issue. I just think we need to keep on, keep on pressing it. I wonder, would this be an opportunity, because there were more questions there that I certainly would have liked to have asked around the Minister around dentistry. Perhaps the committee would agree that we would maybe send off um, some very specific questions, even around the, the Level 2 PP provision and um, BSO involvement in that. Polly, you're looking in. Yeah. Um, I just think that the last time we, we covered this, maybe in late July, we agreed that we would bring the um, interim chief dental officer back and the representative from the Health and Social Care, Care Board to give an update on the outstanding issues. And I suppose um, what we're finding from the minister's letter is that some of the issues still haven't been resolved. So I suppose we, we should be inviting them to another meeting. Colin. Chair, also, uh, I, I'm not aware, just, but the urgent dental care centres were extended to the end of August and we're now into September, so have they closed or have the issues that mean, required them to stay open um, maybe haven't been resolved because that was there was a, a problem uh, around that? So I think we did say back at that meeting at the end of July, if we didn't get to the end of August and satisfactorily clear everything up, that we would bring those people back to... Uh, quite quickly to, to be able to <coughs> find out what's happening, so we need to get that one sharpish. I think that would be appropriate, especially given that we are potentially looking at a second wave of this as well, so we need to find a way going forward. And certainly there's the, the question around the, the follow time as well, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that was really addressed in the correspondence adequately either, so uh, we would want to know what the outcome of any review, uh, well that's happened and what that is. I think there are lots of questions in around how uh, the, the PP level one PP that was supplied, but but the department failed to supply level two, uh, and are kind of leaving it up to the dentists to source that themselves. You'd wonder why that is the case when you would think it would be easier to do that through BSO. So I think there are a number of questions there. So I think we'll be happy enough if it was happy enough that we, we do request that they. Yes, Chair, and, and, and the issue of the follow time is yeah. particularly pertinent. Uh, yeah. Many of the, the dentists are complaining about that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Um, wonder, do we need to do anything more with? So the members content to note them, um, 7.36. Yep, content. Okay, thank you. All right, so moving on to items 7.8 and 7.9, responses from the Department of Health and Department of Finance, respectively, regarding financial support available to HSC and other public sector employees. Who are, who are unable to work due to lack of provision for those they care for and who are not eligible for furlough. So, uh, have members any comments around that? I mean, I certainly that baffled me a bit too because I think that, I don't know where the assumption came from that we're talking about children. Um, 
I think it's a it is a a bigger issue, uh, which obviously affects um, older people who need care and those with disabilities uh, who have been impacted, you know, by closure of day centres, for instance. Um, so the Department of Finance was stating that it's a matter for health, uh, Minister, to bring proposals to seek funding, and yet I think the Minister was. Um, he was really focused on the childcare aspect of it and said he was undertaking to raise it with the executive and the education minister. So any comments on that? Um, or what we could do is, um, if we agree, is to write to all departments concerned to urge them to work together to fund restoration of care services in full and in the meantime to provide adequate financial support for those prevented from working due to absence of care services. If you're happy enough with that, okay. Okay. okay item 7.16 contains further information requested by the committee following the June monitoring briefing from the department on the 18th of June. Any comments from members on that? Oh, sorry, We're going back to 713 or what? This is 7.16. We're going back to 713, sorry, or? Uh, what, sorry, Clark, what is that in the... 7.13 was, the, the proposal on the memo was to note, so, but members can raise any matter and propose a different comment, course just, of action. Um, I and I assume my others got a correspondence from Charlotte Caldwell, um, releasing her son Billy's uh, case, so um, I'm assuming that may have already been forwarded to the Minister, but there's concern about maybe medication uh, prescription running out uh, for her son. Um, just can I... Um, uh, stress that we will forward that correspondence on to the, the minister if it hasn't been done already. I, I don't believe that's in the pack or that, okay. that I have that I, correspondence I if you to, forward it. Yep, thanks. Okay, so thanks, sure. I'm not sure which item that was. In. It wasn't an item in the pack then? Yeah. That, uh, that she was 7.1. I, mean, I know, I know it, it, it was sent, Charlotte sent it to everyone. I mean, I already forwarded it on to the minister, but I suppose the committee, if you're going to forward it to Eilish, yeah. and then we, we forward it on as a committee. Yeah. Then. Okay, it but it's yeah. not in this pack? So no, no, not no, there, it's it? not. Okay. No. It's sent to me and, and Pat, I assume Mother's got it too, but I can forward it on to Eilish if we can send it to the minister, if that's okay. Okay, Paula? It's in connection to the June monitoring round information. Um, I, it might have come in the last few days, but I haven't seen an update or uh, response from the Department of Health in relation to the information we received um, by the departmental officials that funding was going to be made available for the continuation of the PrEP um, pilot project in Belfast and in um, Alton Galvin. As you know, once the um, sexual reproductive health units reopened again, um, the clinicians in there were unable to continue to provide the service after the um, 30th of June. And it's very worrying that we were told on one hand that we were going to get the funding was going to be in place, but that the de um, department has not given the money to the Belfast Health Trust and uh, Western Health Trust. So it's really just clarification around that issue. It's very important. We, the last thing we want are people to be infected and cost hundreds of thousands of pounds of their lifetime to um, treat the illness. So just to inform the committee that the, that letter was sent immediately after the last meeting, I think on the 27th of July that was issued to the department, but we are awaiting a reply. Uh, it would have been due on the 17th, so we can certainly chase that up. Okay, Paul. Okay. Okay, so any further comments on item 7.16, which was around the gin monitoring briefing from members? Okay, and if not, uh, members can tend to note for present pending the upcoming briefing session on October monitoring. Okay, thank you. Item 7.18 and 7.22 are responses from the Trust to the Committee's request for information about timelines for addressing complaints, particularly long-standing complaints for those suspended due to COVID-19. Members, any comments to make on that? No. Um, so are members con to content to note 
pending future consideration of the accountability governance issues and briefings from NIPSO and PCC, etc. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Item 7.32 is a request from an individual to brief the committee on the issues relating to the former mother and baby and Magdalen institutions. Members will remember that this individual initially wrote to the committee in January and that the committee agreed to add the issue to the forward work programme but wasn't able to schedule a briefing due to the pandemic. There has since been a new chair appointed to the Interdepartmental Working Group but the research it commissioned has not yet been published. Are there any comments from members on that particular issue? And if not, uh, are members content to write Paula to the there, Paula. <laughs> Paula, on ahead, sorry. Muted. Muted. You're muted. Can't hear you, Paula. I think you're muted, Paula. I, I, I had a recent meeting with the new chair of the um, working group. Um, I think that she's got a very ambitious program of work. Um, I think it'd be very useful to invite her to the committee to give us an update on that because I know that part of her work will also be around historical, clerical um, child sex abuse in, the, uh, in terms of reference, in terms of the research into that has been developed and hopefully will be signed off soon. So I think that she has plenty to tell this committee and that it might be possible then to partner her presentation up back to back with um, that individual's um, request to give evidence. So if members are content, we'll write to the Chair of the Interdepartmental Working Group to seek an update on its work to date and ask if and when research is to be published and to inform the individual of the committee's actions. Okay. Content, thank you. Um, members, are you otherwise content with the actions as noted in the correspondence memo? Can I just maybe bouncing back to item 7.7 .7 in that? Um, we had received an update that basically it was in July saying that they were still giving consideration to the report. Maybe it could be right off again, given that it will probably take about another two to three weeks to get a response. And by that stage, we'll be about two months down the line from the original question, just to see if there would be some um, update about the implementation of that report. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we able to do that, Clark? Can I just come in that wee point sure, that's behind Colin? Um, yeah, the, I, I had a, an individual request in to meet with, with Robin Swan on the issue, so, um, but he, um, he is refusing to meet. I know that he met with one of the campaign groups, Sling the Mesh, um, but so uh, as of yet, I still haven't seen any of the detail. There isn't a lot of detail in that mm -hmm. response that we've got about the working group. So um, I would support um, Colin's suggestion about writing off to the minister. And if we can try and get more detail around um, the establishment of this working group and more importantly, the timelines of the recommendations um, around the first two no harm report. I seen that just yesterday Scotland had announced that they're already putting in plans to put in place their patient safety commissioner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we really don't want to be um, lagging behind here in, in the north um, mm -hmm. because there's too many women that's been impacted by um, this mesh um, implant scandal. So um, if we get that letter in, that would that would be great. Trying to get the drill down into the timelines and the makeup of the the, the working group um, as well. And maybe just, Ailey, sorry if you could note to ask the question about um, what um, patient representatives um, or people with um, lived experience will be um, taking part in the working group as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, apart from that, are members content with the actions as noted in the correspondence memo? Apart from that one. Thank you. All right. Turning to uh, table papers, there are five items of correspondence at tab 7.33 and 7.37 of table pack. 7.37 is the latest report on the temporary children's services regulations we considered in the spring, updating item 7.30. I'm sure members will welcome the commitment that the department makes to revoke the regulations later this month and revert to standards to time, time scales for social care reviews and visits. So if members any comments to make on this or any of the other tabled items? And if not, are members content to note the correspondence in the table papers? Note. Okay, thank you. So we're on to item eight, which is the forward work programme. Uh, can I refer members to the draft forward work programme at tab 8.1 of the pack? Are members content to note the forward work programme? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, on to nine, which is any other business? Members have any other business? Um, just following on from the Minister's briefing there, um, I, was, I know he had agreed to supply the criteria for the specialist centres and the White Abbey um, step down. So, um, but the, the question around the figures um, that the department holds um, around how many people um, are self-isolating or should be self-isolating. Um, I know that uh, he had mentioned that obviously the PHA with their contact tracing system and then with the system around the passenger locator forms, that they do track the numbers, but could we write to the department just to see if they could provide us with, with those, if that's okay? So could you, could you give me again exactly what so we're looking for, so for the, the, the numbers of people who, are, who should be? or Yes, to, to provide us with the, the figures um, around how many people um, should be <coughs> self-isolating. Um, so Robin Swan was saying it will fall under the, the PHA contact tracing programme and then the, um, the people who are travelling um, back into, into the country from abroad. Perhaps, Chair, if, if you don't mind, I could update the committee that in your pack for next week, there will be an, an, an offer from the PHA to brief you on the contact tracing operation. So if you're content, you could do it that way, or we could certainly write as well if you wish, um, or, or you could accept that briefing and pursue right that, in pursue that, that in that yeah. way if you wish. Yeah, it's up to you, whatever No, you that's prefer. no problem, that's fair. Okay, could, could we write and tell them that we want that information in the briefing then, and that way it'll oh, yeah. be here in two weeks' time? And that would be even better. I think the point is that the, the letter will be in the next pack, so we, could, we can address, make your request on the back of that letter, as opposed to on the back of no letter, because we don't have it in this pack. If that's okay. Happy enough for you? Yeah, thank you. Temporary issue, sure, yeah. Sorry? Temporary issue, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, we just got an email this morning um, from Marjorie McGann. His son Dahi is obviously um, part of the organ donation campaign. So next week is organ donation week, um, and we received an email from Dahi and the campaign. Just want to suggest that the health committee share that information, and it's encouraging people to take part in a, in a coffee station week uh, in their constituency offices or places of work. Um, I just think it would be important that the, the health committee shares that and promotes that event uh, next week, if we can. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other members? Paula, do you have anything? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And we're on to uh, item 10, date, time and place of next meeting. The next meeting will be held Thursday 10th of September in room 29, so we will need some volunteers to participate remotely. Okay. What time is that next week, Paul? 10 a.m. 10 a.m.? Dan. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. <laughs>